Our message for this afternoon is found from the words of John 3.16. You find those in the bulletin, the program in front of you, where we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, dear sister Mary Lou, family, friends, and church family, we're here to remember and celebrate the life of Tom Rice with thanksgiving to the Lord for the gift that he has given to us. Uh, Tom, as many of you know, was a quiet man, and yet he was a man who loved spending his time outdoors, uh, fishing, or raising his award-winning dogs. Uh, He was one who preferred serving in the background. Uh, He spent tireless hours at the at the local gun club serving as the maintenance chairman and working for years with the Niagara South School Board. But above these things, Tom dearly loved his family. Uh, He spoke of enjoying his time with his nieces and nephews, and especially we saw in his life his faithful commitment to Mary Lou, uh, his dear wife always looking to put her first. And over the past few years, Tom also uh, grew to get to know and love our church family as well. And although he was one who did not like to leave the house, he was always happy to have people stop by. And his favorite thing that he would tell us would be, you don't need to call, but please drop in. And so many did. And recently I had the opportunity to do that uh, with Tom after he returned home from the hospital. I was able to visit him a couple of times. And it was quite obvious that uh, he was weak and his time was short. And in these moments, Tom wanted to speak about the reality of his never dying soul, the reality of eternity, the need to know God through Jesus Christ as the only hope for eternity. And in these conversations, one thing that Tom shared really struck me. He told me that he was so thankful that his doctors were honest with him, that they told him honestly that he didn't have long to live, so that he wouldn't fool himself. Their honesty helped him to face death. And friends, like Tom's honest doctor, I want to speak to us this afternoon about the realities of life and death, and that Tom's death would remind us that we too will one day have to die as well. And the question for us then is, are we ready for that day? Do we have a solid, well-grounded hope for eternity? For what happens after this life comes to an end. And the words that I want to speak to you from are the words that Tom wanted on his tombstone. John 3, 16. This can be the only hope for any of us when death comes. John 3, 16. These are the well-known words of Jesus where he gives us the good news of the Bible in a nutshell. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so in our time together, I want to speak with you about the love of God. That's our title, The Love of God. And three points. First, the staggering fact. Second, the supreme gift. And third, the saving purpose. The love of God, first of all, the staggering fact. Uh, The most astounding message that you will ever hear in your life is what you're hearing from this text that we just read. God so loved the world. That is utterly surprising. Now, maybe you're not too surprised by that because I imagine many of us know those words. This is a familiar text. 
But have we grasped the reality of what these words are saying? God so loved the world. Do we understand their meaning? Uh, if we understand the meaning of this text, then we, you will have to agree with me then that this is the most staggering fact in all the world. And so that's where we want to begin. We want to look at these words. God so loved the world. First of all, we meet God. God, that is the one true God. God, our almighty creator. God who formed and fashioned everything that we see, including ourselves. This is our creator. And he's our personal provider. Everything that you and I have in life comes from this one source, from this God. He's the one who takes care of the big things in this world, like keeping the earth on its axis and positioning us at the right distance from the sun so that life on earth can thrive. He takes care of these big cosmic things. But he's also the one who takes care of the little things, the personal things, the important little things like keeping our hearts beating. You and I, we can't control that, but he does. Well, this perfect, holy, powerful being is the God being described to us in our text. And yet there's another party described to us. God so loved the world. And what a contrast we find between God and the world. Uh, there couldn't be a greater contrast. The key characteristic of God is that he is good. And the key characteristic of the world is that we are bad. The world, or humanity, these are God's creatures. And the Bible tells us that in our own experience, it shows us, as we look at our own lives and the lives of others, it shows us that we have rebelled against this God. We have declared war on God. Uh, rather than loving God and his good law, we naturally will, will push God and his law away from us. Uh, he can have the, the fringes of our life, maybe, but he can't be at the center. In fact, just three verses after our text, Jesus describes the world he says, the world are those who loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And this is the character of us all as, as sinful humanity. Uh, we love the dark. We're drawn to the dark. And so we hate God who is light. Now, friends, I'm acting as the doctor right now, telling us the honest, hard, uncomfortable truth. We all have problems in life, many problems, but Jesus wants us to know that this is our greatest problem. It's this problem of our moral corruption, and, and this corruption, it's spread everywhere, and it impacts all that we do. So we don't think, do, and say things that we ought to, but we think, do, and say things that are wrong and twisted. And due to us ignoring God and breaking his law, his just punishment rests over us. Again, Jesus' words, two verses later, the unbelieving world is condemned already. This is the bad news about me. This is the bad news about us. And yet, this is why it's so urgent as well. This is why Tom wanted to speak to me when he heard he was dying, uh, that we might be ready to meet our maker in peace. This life will come to an end, and we will have to give an account. And so are we ready? Well, how can we be? How can we be ready? What's, what's your hope? It's, it's hopeless in us. Uh, there's no amount of self-help books that will fix our core problem. The problem is too deep-rooted. It's too widespread. But that then brings us to the staggering fact of God's great love, he says, God so loved the world. And that's the most astonishing news in all the world, the best news in all the world. Yes, the bad news is that we continue in this world apart from God, under God's just punishment, 
And yet he meets us with this good news that he loves sinners. And it's an unexplainable love. By that, I mean, we can explain human love. Uh, Human love, uh, in human love, we see something attractive about someone. We, We are drawn to their character, drawn to their personality. And so we love them. But God's love is different. Uh, He loves his enemies. He loves the world that hated him. He loves those who have nothing lovely to offer him. This is an undeserved and unearned love. And yet, amazingly, it's a love that's strong enough that moves God to do something for those who hate him. That takes us to the second point, the supreme gift. Notice, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now these words tell us that God's love for this world that has committed uh, treason against him, this world that has turned away from God's love for the world is not something that's generic. It's not something that's uh, these fluffy thoughts of best wishes and, and hoping for the best. But no, God's love is an intense love that moves him, that leads him to a specific action. Notice Jesus says, God so loved that he gave. That he gave. God's love, it moved him. The intensity of his love compelled him to do something to those who needed help in saving. And so here we're seeing the heights of God's love and his supreme gift to sinners And the first thing we want to see is the supreme value of this gift. It says, He so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son. And so that's the Father's gift. His only begotten Son. And to help us see the greatness of this gift, that this is the greatest gift that could ever have been given, Uh, The Apostle John, in his letter, he tells us over and over again of the Father's love for his Son. So, in fact, in this chapter, John 3, verse 35, we read, The Father loves the Son. Uh, There's nothing more precious to God the Father than his own eternal Son. And as a father myself, I have uh, two boys. I know what it is to love my sons. Uh, I know what it is to enjoy their presence and to delight in watching them, uh, in spending time with them, watching them grow and develop. And yet, my love for my sons is but a pale reflection of the Father's love for his eternal Son. Uh, His Son is the unique Son of God, the, the one who is God himself, who perfectly reflects and imitates the Father. And The father then loves his son with this constant overflowing love, this love that has has never ended, never stopped, and can't fully be grasped. And yet, here's the amazing thing. The father's chosen gift for this sinful world, this world that doesn't want to think about him, this world that doesn't want him in their lives, his chosen gift to this world is his own son, the one he loves most. And so here the father is giving his best. Uh, When he gave Jesus, there was nothing greater. There was no greater treasure in heaven that God could have given. Uh, The Lord could have given us millions of dollars and that would have been nothing. That would have been peanuts in comparison to his son. This is the most valuable gift. The most needed and necessary gift for each of us. But this gift, it also came at a cost. Notice Jesus says, that he gave, the father gave his own son. And that word, that little word gave, it it holds tremendous cost into it. Uh, Because here's the father and he's giving his son not to a nice, easy life, but if you know the gospel at all, if you know the story of Jesus at all, you know what the father is giving him to and what he's giving him to do. Before time began, the father appointed his son as a savior for his people. And in doing that, the father knew what that meant for his son. Uh, He knew the long, hard road that led from uh, the, the manger where Jesus was born, through the cross, 
where his son, where Jesus Christ suffered and died, and to the empty tomb, where Jesus then rose again in victory over death. The father knew all of that. He knew every ounce of suffering that his son would bear. Uh, He knew the sorrows that his son would face. He knew the cry that his son would utter on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father knew all of this. So there's cost in him giving his son, knowing this, yet he gave his only son. And behind that then is telling us of this amazing, this astounding love of God. We see the supreme love. Notice God so loved that he gave. This is the gospel message. This is the good news the best news in all the world. It's the love of God, love of of God the Father reaching out to sinners like you and I in the gift of his own dear son. And the Father, he was not a reluctant giver. Sometimes people give us gifts and they don't really want to give us a gift. Their arm's kind of being twisted. It's kind of forced. They feel compelled to give us a gift. That's not God at all. This was his free choice. He loved, and so he gave. There's no other explanation than his own love reaching out towards the unlovely. And so Mary Lou and others who are grieving, this is the God who is speaking to us this afternoon. This God of infinite love. Uh, This one who is saying, you can turn to me. You can trust me. You can cast your cares upon me. You can go to me in your need. I've given you my son to show you how much I love and care for you and how I will be your father. But third, this takes us to the saving purpose. Why did God do all this? Why such costly giving love? Why would the great creator, uh, the one who who doesn't need us for anything, why would he take interest in us? What's his purpose? Well, John 3.16 tells us that whoever believes in him, that is in Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so this, friends, is God's saving purpose. Uh, This is what's motivating God. It's his concern that we might not perish. The implication is that if we remain as we are, we shall perish. And we shall perish forever. And yet God in his love, he has done something to rescue us. He's done something to prevent that perishing. He's done something to save and to rescue, to deliver. But notice that this isn't a universal salvation. It's not that everyone goes to heaven. It's exclusive Uh, There's only one way to eternal peace with this God, and it's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that whoever believes in him should not perish. And so Jesus is quite clear. It's, It's only those who are believing in him that escape this perishing. Well, what does that mean? What's that mean to believe in Jesus? It's not just believing on Jesus. It's not just believing that Jesus was a historical figure. And that uh, he really lived. That's true. Uh, Historians can hardly refute that point. Uh, Most people believe that there was a real man named Jesus. We need to know that. But believing in Jesus is much more than that. It's believing that Jesus is who he said he was. That he is the very son of God. That he is the savior of sinners. Uh, In fact, believing in Jesus Uh, it could be translated quite literally as believing into Jesus. And that helps us understand what this means, believing into Jesus. Um, Just this week, I was on a plane flying out west. And if I was to just look at the plane and believe it existed, that wouldn't help me get to my destination. But in order to Uh, benefit from the plane's services, I had to go into the plane. I had to step into the plane. And as soon as I did that, the doors closed and I flew off to Alberta. And then the same thing back here. And that's the same spiritually then. 
It's not just believing in the existence of Jesus, but it's uh, casting ourselves upon him. It's entering into a relationship with this Christ. It's surrendering ourselves to him, saying, I am yours. Be at the center of my life. Maybe I've never said that in my life before, but Lord, help me to know you. Be merciful to me. This believing in Jesus, it means uh, resting in him alone. It means not hoping in myself, not that I'm not the worst person in the world. There are other people worse than me. There are. So I should be okay in the end. No, that's, that won't do. Believing in him means resting in him alone. He's my only hope. It means receiving him with the empty hand of faith. I'm not earning God's favor. God doesn't ask me to earn his favor. Uh, we cannot. Notice that there's no uh, conditions uh, stated in that way in order to have everlasting life. It doesn't say you must uh, keep certain rules for so long, then you will have everlasting life. But it says simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will live. And so friend, if you do, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have everlasting life. This is God's saving purpose. Uh, This is why he sent his son. He doesn't merely just want to rescue us from punishment, what we rightly deserve, but he also wants to welcome us into his family. Uh, He wants to bring us to himself. He wants us to have fellowship with him. He wants us to be in his life-giving presence forever. And so that's what's all bound up in this word, and you shall have everlasting life. It doesn't just mean life that doesn't end. Well, it is that. But much better than that, it means knowing the everlasting one, being in the presence of God, being in his life-giving presence, being in a personal relationship with the almighty and gracious Savior. And yes, if you believe on Jesus, then you have that. This is eternal life. This is the hope I could hold out to Tom Tom, this is life eternal. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and this is yours. And so for the Christian, death is just a passageway into a more full experience of God's presence. A more full experience of life. This is why for the Christian, there are tears and yet there's rejoicing, even in death. Do you have a hope like that? Do you have something that can hold you up Not only in life when things are going well, but also in death, in those worst moments. Well, for the Christian, now we know him in part. We enjoy God in part already. But then our joy will be full because we will see our Lord face to face. All of this because of the love of God. All of this because he reached out to us sinners. Uh, it's, It's staggering. Our words cannot come close to describing the love of this God goes against all expectation. It defines or defies all human categories. It almost sounds too good to be true. And yet the Lord has said it. And the Lord has done it in the life, death, and resurrection of his dear son. And now he's inviting all of us. Did you notice that word, whoever? Whoever believes in Christ. Maybe you're saying this isn't, not for me. And the Lord is saying, whoever, he's calling us by name, whoever we are, rich or poor, educated, uneducated, religious, unreligious, God is inviting us to himself to have the greatest, deepest joy and satisfaction that we can know in life. And so what an offer. What an offer. Who would refuse this offer? Well, friend, I hope that you will not Refuse this God in his love. And Mary Lou, again, this God is the one who is with you. This God of love is the one who is saying, trust me in your darkest nights. Uh, This one who gave his own son is the one who is saying, trust me in your loneliest moments. When you are afraid, come to me. In your deepest grief, throw yourself upon me. I am the God of love and I will care for you. Well, let me close with the words of the great hymn. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. 
It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. And dear friends, if that's the song of your life now, then that will be the song of your life forever in the presence of God. May that be true of all of us. Amen. At this time, we like to sing songs.